Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the special event that's being sponsored tonight by Partners for Democracy. We're focusing on Arizona and Nevada, and this is the first of several events in which we'll be focusing on the so-called target states. It's a very interesting time in the election. On the one hand, national polls give Donald Trump anywhere from a 3 to 8% lead. He's plowed his way through the primaries, decimating every other Republican candidate. And yet, uh, while Trump has won the primaries, he is consistently underperforming. He's been less than 60% and less than the pre-poll projections suggested he might get. He's embracing positions that are out of sync with the electorate. His strength comes predominantly from white males who did not attend uh, college and they're not the dominant demographic in America. And on a macro level, the economy is exceeding expectations. GDP grew by 4.1% over the past two quarters. We have the lowest unemployment rate, 3.5% in a peacetime economy since World War II. Inflation has fallen dramatically, and it's the lowest of all G7 countries. And Biden's delivered on his promises. There are 40 million borrowers who have enjoyed student loan debt relief. The infrastructure bill has been enacted. He aggressively put in place a program to combat climate change. He's defending reproductive rights. We have the lowest uninsured rate for health insurance uh, in history. And yet the electoral map continues to be a great concern, particularly in the so-called target states. In many of those states, which we define as being Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, Georgia, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, Trump is ahead. We sent you an email last week describing the importance of these states, and that's what we're going to focus on over the next several weeks. There is an important primary today in Michigan where the potency of the Israel-Gaza war on Biden's chances are being tested. So tonight, this is the first of the three special events on the target states. What are they? Why are they so important? What does the political landscape in those states look like and why? What are our prospects in those states and what can we do about it? Tonight, beginning with Arizona and Nevada, Jim Trengrove will serve as our moderator. But before I turn it over to him, I just want to issue a spoiler alert. While you will learn a lot tonight from our esteemed panel, this is also a fundraiser. We, all, we are going to ask you to contribute to a group that is working hard to get out the vote. The group is Somos Votantes. This is your opportunity to more than fret about November. Even a small amount will help. And you can do that by going to our website, partnersfordemocracy.org. And I will put that email address in the chat, but please consider contributing to this important group, which you'll hear from tonight. So Jim, I will now pass the baton to you, Jim Trengrove. Okay, thank you, Ed, um, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is our Partners for Democracy special event, and uh, we will have a focus on Arizona and uh, Nevada with uh, Katie Drapchow from Global Strategy Group and Melissa Morales from uh, Somos of uh, Ventanas. Uh, but we're going to begin uh, with uh, Norman Ornstein, uh, a longtime friend of this pro of this uh, group, uh, political scholar, election uh, analyst, and senior fellow. Emeritus at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, again, a longtime friend. And I first want to go to this map here. Uh, 538 electoral votes available among the 50 states, 270 needed to win. Um, and it's generally agreed that 43 states are already taken. Um, they can be predicted. Uh, 226 Electoral votes expected for Joe Biden, 219 for the presumed uh, Republican nominee, Donald Trump. That leaves 93 votes up for grabs in just seven states, um, the target states, as we call them. So let's go to Norm. Uh, Norm, uh, based on the results of the two past presidential elections, razor thin margins in each of those seven states. Uh, and it looks like the same uh, for 2024. Indeed, it does, Jim. Uh, first, I want to thank you and Ed and all of the people in this wonderful organization for what you're doing to deal with this existential threat that we face. We know that uh, barring some unforeseen development, 
2024 is going to be razor thin again. And I want to start by uh, just some basics. Uh, first, we're going to focus on these seven. And uh, as we see journalists and others begin to look at the political landscape, they're going to be looking at a lot of other states. In terms of presidential politics, they're just not meaningful. I might have one small caveat, my native Minnesota. Uh, Biden won that by 7% uh, the last time. But Minnesota was very close in uh, 2016. And it's still not a state that you can entirely take for granted. It's part of that swath of states in the Midwest and the upper Midwest with uh, Wisconsin and Michigan uh, included that are still, uh, still critically important. The key thing to remember here is that with these very close margins, there are really two groups of people who are the key. They're not uh, homogeneous entirely, but this is where our election will have to focus. The first is Biden is going to need an energized and active and enthusiastic base. And there we know that there are multiple challenges. We obviously see some of them in Michigan tonight with Muslim American and especially Arab American voters, a key voting block, particularly in that state, Dearborn, uh, if an election is close, uh, that could make a difference. We know that Biden faces some challenges with young progressive voters where Gaza is also an issue. And there's a challenge with young male African American voters with some Hispanic voters as well, although again, not a, a homogeneous group, and I'm sure we'll have a bigger discussion of that. How do we get a base more enthused? The second group, of course, is the swing voters, so-called, but in these states in particular, it is the college-educated suburban Republicans and independents. It's Bucks County in Pennsylvania, for example. People who went more significantly at least enough for Biden in places like the suburbs around Detroit and in Bucks County to provide those thin margins that enabled him to win. The same was true, of course, in Fulton County in Georgia and in a couple of other more prosperous counties. Now, these were people who were turned off by Trump and also believed that the turmoil of the, Biden, of the Trump term could be dealt with more effectively by uh, lowering the temperature with Biden. At this point, they need persuading that the turmoil that we faced, ironically, mostly because of the obduracy uh, and uh, the uh, radicalism of Republicans in Congress and in the states, is something that could rebound against Biden. So we're going to need some help on all of those fronts. And we're going to have to deal with some of the realities of a voter turnout that is not entirely uh, in the hands of people who should be handling voter turnout. We are fortunate in many of these states, in Michigan especially, where we have uh, a triumvirate of a governor, lieutenant governor, excuse me, attorney general, and secretary of state, three of uh, the most remarkable politicians who all also happen to be women, who are going to protect the vote there. We'll have some ability to protect the vote in Wisconsin with the governor and with uh, a Supreme Court that is not going to allow serious voter suppression measures. But we also know that in many of these states, local election officials, some who were, in fact, great public servants, forced out or intimidated by threats and by the attempts to overturn the 2020 election, have in many cases been replaced by those who are not entirely trustworthy. Some of our effort is gonna to have to be to protect the vote on election day. What I would say more broadly is, of course, as Ed mentioned, the remarkable accomplishments of the Biden administration, and given the headwinds, given a uh, divided government now, but razor thin margins in his first two years, a uh, basically, country gripped with COVID fatigue and with tribalism, enormous uh, resistance from states, the accomplishments that we've seen uh, are just nothing short of remarkable. But we are not going to convince voters who are not thrilled with Biden, whether it's because of his age or the sense that he's not fully in charge 
or because they don't even know what has happened, that they should vote for him just because of things that have been accomplished if they don't feel particularly happy. And while inflation has come down remarkably, we also know that there are a lot of voters who still feel it with food prices and in a couple of other ways. And if we just say to them, you're wrong, it's much better than you think, that's not gonna work. My advice to the Biden administration has been that we need to leverage, first of all, the areas where Republicans have shown extraordinary extremism. And that can't just come, for example, with what we'll see in a couple of weeks in the State of the Union, uh, where we're gonna have this brave woman who was told in Texas that uh, she would not get treated, even though she had a non-viable fetus and might have her life or her ability to have children destroyed if she did not uh, have access to an abortion, who left the state and got treated, she'll be in the gallery in the State of the Union. That's great. But the fact is the voters we need to persuade are not going to be ones who watch the State of the Union. And it will be not just a one-day story, but one small part of a whole lot of other stories that will emerge uh, on uh, that evening. I want Joe Biden to go to Texas and to meet not just with this woman, but the woman featured on the front page of the Washington Post a day or two ago with an ectopic pregnancy, utterly non-viable, facing a clear and present danger of death, who was told by physicians that they had their hands tied and they could not treat her. She finally was able to find another hospital where they did go right to the lion's den in Texas and meet with her, meet with OBGYNs who are leaving the state because there is no opportunity to provide not just reproductive health, but all of women's health. Go to Tennessee, meet with families desperately wanting children now denied because of the restrictions on frozen embryos, including cancer patients whose only opportunities to have children will be through those frozen embryos. Meet with People in fertility clinics now having to cancel out or shut down or at least temporarily suspend their opportunities. He should be out there in those states where there are going to be plenty of people opposing him, but highlighting these issues over and over again. And that means also highlighting another reality, which is that the Heritage Foundation Trump campaign Project 2025 has made it very clear that they are not just aiming at uh, dealing with the issue of abortion, but they wanna cut out contraception. They wanna cut out uh, premarital sex entirely. They wanna end gay marriage and criminalize gay sex as well. All of those issues need to be pounded away at over and over again to convince reluctant base voters and those college-educated suburban voters of the dangers that we face. At the same time, the biggest issue facing us, as we know and we know from the whole creation of this group, is the direct threat to democracy. And we know that Donald Trump is not cushioning what he says about this. When Adolf Hitler ran for uh, election the first time, he reached out to the business community in Germany and to others and said, look, I'm, I'm not, not to worry. You don't have to worry about me. I'm gonna fit in with traditions, but I'll make sure that you won't get regulated, that the uh, liberal Democrats are not gonna uh, uh, tax you anymore. But at the same time, uh, it was pretty clear what was coming, but he cushioned the blow before it happened. Donald Trump is not cushioning anything. Neither are his closest followers. And there, in all of these states, Biden needs to go and visit and point out what Trump, what his own people are saying. And I believe he also needs to have a summit on democracy, highlighting especially all of those Trump officials who served in the first term, who are now out there saying that was nothing compared to what he would do this time around. I'd make just one other larger point, which is something that Partners for Democracy and the rest of us have to keep in mind and keep uh, ever present. Something that Tom Hartman first pointed out, uh, I think publicly, 
you know, Tom Swazi, who just won the seat that had uh, been uh, held by the serial liar in New York, George Santos, for two weeks has not been seated. The Speaker of the House has not seated him because they wanted to keep that vote away so that they could impeach uh, Secretary Mayorkas. He's likely to be sworn in tomorrow. What happens if Democrats keep the House, or win the House, I should say, and on January 3rd, Speaker uh, Mike Johnson says, you know, there are 10 seats that Democrats won. We think they didn't win them legitimately. We are not going to swear them in. He has the legal authority most likely to be able to do that, but he could then use that as the ability to, in effect, stage a coup on January 6th saying that the electoral votes do not uh, uh, mount up to 270 and that the election will be decided in the House by state where there will be a majority of those states. We need to simply highlight the possibility that they could stage a coup so that if something like that is in the offing, we have our ducks in a row and the ability to counter it at that time. We have more threats than one can imagine. And just one final comment, we will talk uh, in, in this series about the specifics in the individual states, and I didn't want to get into that so much because we have such experts coming. But keep in mind that there are uh, that within some of these states and in others, there are these other critically important elections within these particular states in Arizona, in Nevada, we have and Wisconsin, we have Senate races that are of utmost importance. With Ruben Gallego in Arizona, with Jackie Rosen running for re-election in uh, Nevada, with uh, Tammy Baldwin running in Wisconsin, which is simply not a sure thing. And along with that, Sherrod Brown in Ohio and uh, John Tester in Montana. We need to be sure we give every bit of support to try and keep the Senate, uh, or at least keep it as close as possible and we need to focus on those key House elections. And that means as well, for example, giving support to Mary Patola in Alaska, the only seat in Alaska, because if there is an election in the House uh, for president where they vote by state, every one of those states gets one vote. So we have a broader responsibility and need here, one that's greater than any that I can recall in any election over five decades. And with that, Jim, let me stop. And I know you have some <laughs> questions. Well, uh, Norm, I wanted to ask you about how are you looking at the, the current polls? Uh, the president seems to be trailing in all the target states um, and, are, and, uh, and especially on the issue of the economy, he's not doing well. How do you view these? Well, first, I'm not looking at these polls because polls at this stage are simply not terribly meaningful, but also... Uh, there, uh, we have a crisis in the polling world, and a lot of these uh, polls are dubious, to say the least. I had a little exchange uh, today with a journalist who uh, said that the real clear politics average shows that Donald Trump's approval has risen in the last several weeks, while Biden's has declined. But if you look at the real clear politics average, it includes bogus polls like Rasmussen, highly partisan polls. So. We have to be careful about looking at polls. Having said that, we know that Joe Biden does not have the approval rating as a president that he either deserves or needs to be in a strong position to win. And we know that there is still a significant problem with the economy. Having said that, when you look at uh, things like public approval on the economy, as with almost every issue now in an age of tribalism, you have to parse it out a significant share of the negative feeling about the economy is coming from Republicans. And that drags down the numbers from where it would otherwise be. That doesn't mean there isn't a problem here. There is. Biden needs to focus not necessarily as much on the good things that have happened in the economy, and it has been an absolutely remarkable, but to make it clear to those voters that he feels their pain and he's going to do what he can uh, to help out. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Norm. Uh, and let me just uh, tell all the uh, the participants uh, or viewers out there that if you 
if you do have a question, uh, put it in the chat and we'll try to get to it. Uh, uh, the questions for Norm or for, or for our two other guests who are going to follow. Um, Norm, I was just looking at some of these uh, vote differences from 2016 and 2020 uh, in what they call, I guess, the blue wall for the Democrats. Um, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Trump won by point. Uh, 2%, 0.7%, 0 0.7%, 7 tenths of a percent in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, respectively. Uh, in 2020, Biden, 2.8%, 0.7%, and 1.2% in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Um, uh, so the hope is that with the 226 electoral votes, he probably, probably already has pocketed. Those three states alone could put him uh over 270 or at 270 and we don't want him to be at 270 because okay we we want him to be uh higher than that so that we don't get these disputes that could lead to another january 6th or you know something that in some ways is worse in that it wouldn't necessarily be a violent insurrection but something that would be technically legal challenging votes and sending it again to the house uh, one other thing I should have mentioned, Jim, which is if you look in 2016, in those three states, Jill Stein won more votes than the margin by which uh, Trump got elected. And my greatest fear is not that uh, Joe Biden could lose to Donald Trump in a one-on-one -on -one contest. I think what we're seeing here is something that Ed mentioned earlier. There are at least some Republicans who are really repelled and repulsed by Trump. Now it's a tribal era, and the fact that you know forty percent in uh, South Carolina voted for Nikki Haley or another alternative doesn't mean that they're all going to vote against Trump. Most of them will come back to their tribal identity. But you need some share of them. And that's what Biden got in twenty twenty to put him over the top. I am really worried about the role that, no labels, an utterly pernicious and dangerous force could play here. But I'm also worried about RFK Jr. Even if we see some polls now showing that he's pulling as many votes from Republicans as Democrats, I don't believe it in the end. And I'm worried about Jill Stein again, and I'm worried about Cornell West. We're not talking about huge numbers for a Cornell West, but what we're seeing with West, I think we'll see it with Kennedy, we're seeing it with Stein as well, is they're trying to use the Gaza issue now as a wedge to pull votes away from Biden, and they might have some success on that front. And one of the things that we have to do over and over again is convince swing voters and base voters that a vote for anybody else is a vote for Donald Trump and a vote to end our democracy and our experiment with democratic values and send us to a hellscape where the handmaid's tale looks mild by comparison. All right. Thank you, Norm. I hope you stick around. Um, and I just want to br bring this one question, just throw it out there. Uh, maybe we'll answer it over the uh, the next few minutes. In Arizona, this is from Christina. In Arizona, we have 25% of the eight MAGA congressional representatives in Arizona. They're up for re-election. Uh, only weak Democratic candidates are, are up against them, and no one seems to be working on this effort. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but, um, uh, you know, a pitch there to make a stronger representation by Democrats on the congressional level. Watch Andre Cherney, uh, who's one of those candidates, who's uh, just a remarkable guy and uh, support him. Okay. Uh, uh, Norm, stick around. Let's go to Katie Dropcho now. Uh, she is the uh, vice president of research at uh, Global Strategy Group. Uh, Katie, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. It's terrific to be here. Thank you for uh, you all for joining tonight and for the organization for hosting me. Uh, it's an honor to to speak with you tonight. Uh, my name oh, is Katie. Yep, go Katie, ahead. I should just say that now we had advertised that Rosa Mendoza was good, uh, was going to be on that as your colleague. She was unexpectedly called away, couldn't attend tonight. Uh, I thanked her for uh, uh, helping get you and getting you to jump in at the, at the last moment here. But uh, I know that you've been working on uh, these uh, democratic issues for more than a decade now, and um, uh, we're leading the uh, research and polling at Priorities USA, which was the leading pack 
um, Democratic PAC supporting uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, so uh, Arizona and and uh, Nevada uh, is on your uh, is on your board uh, going into 2024. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, first of all, Norm's introduction was terrific, and uh, he really laid out a lot of the themes of what I'm going to talk about. So when we think about the key battleground states, as, as Jim mentioned at the top, we can sort, sort them into what we traditionally call the blue wall, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, and Wisconsin. And then we can sometimes shorthand at it as the Sun Belt, uh, states like Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona. So zeroing in on an Arizona and Nevada, we expect these states to be highly competitive in 2024. Um, and as Norm said, they're going to be competitive both because they are presidential battleground states and because they both have competitive Senate elections um, going into 2024 as well. So let's talk about Arizona first. Um, in 2020, Joe Biden won Arizona by 0.3 percent uh, of, on, on the margin. That is a difference in real votes of about 10,000. Um, he flipped Nevada, um, I'm sorry, Arizona, uh, from red to blue in 2020. Arizona hadn't historically been much of a battleground. I'm sure we all remember the days when it was a reliable uh, Republican state. Um, but we won it just by the thinnest of margins in 2020. Jump forward to 2022, Senator Mark Kelly uh, wins Arizona with 51% of the vote. So we're coming off of two cycles of Democratic victories in Arizona, but by extremely small margins. Um, certainly going to be one of the top uh, races in 2024. Similar story with Nevada. Nevada has been a battleground for longer than Arizona, as I'm sure we all remember. Um, in 2020, Biden won Nevada with 50.1% of the vote. So as close as you can get to a bare majority as possible. Um, in 2022, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto won Nevada with just under 49% support. Her margin over her opponent was less than 1%, and we're talking about around 30,000 votes. So these are enormously important to uh, protecting uh, the presidency, protecting Democratic Senate uh, the senators, and we're talking about margins in the tens of thousands. Um, as we head into 2024, as I mentioned, we've got two competitive Senate elections in both of these states again. Um, the other thing that these two states have in common is they both have large Hispanic and Latino populations. In 2020, in Arizona, 17% of all voters were Hispanic Latino. Uh, in Nevada, that number was 14% in 2020. So we're talking about one in six voters in each of these states uh, being Hispanic and Latino. Norm talked about the importance of persuasion and turnout, and, and Hispanic Latino voters in these two battleground states are important to both components um, of Democrats' path to victory. So if you'll permit me, um, I have a, a, a short deck on Hispanic and Latino voters. Uh, that I'd love to to run through if that sure, works. Please. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right, let me pull it up. Okay, so I have a short uh, sli slide deck here. I'm going to run through the top lines pretty quickly. First, I'm going to talk about issues, and then I'm going to talk about the political landscape. So what are the top issues with voters? Um, when we ask voters overall, this includes not just Hispanic, but all voters nationally, they tell us their most important issues that they want Congress to focus on is, the, is inflation and jobs in the economy. You can see in the bar chart on the left, that's number one and number two uh, among voters overall. That's pretty consistent with what we've seen in research going back the past um, several years. And I think we all know the impact that inflation and rising costs have had on, on everyone in America, and voters are really feeling it. When we look at just Hispanic voters, and you can see that column to the right, that's just showing how the Hispanic voters in the poll answered the question. Inflation and jobs in the economy is even more important to Hispanic voters. 56% of Hispanic Americans nationally say inflation is one of their top issues. 42% say it's jobs in the economy. It is in a league of its own with Hispanic voters. Um, 
Why is that the case? One reason to suggest that's the case is because Hispanic voters tend to have negative outlooks towards the U.S. economy overall, as well as their personal financial situation. 67% of Hispanic voters think the U.S. economy is not so good or poor. 54% describe their own personal financial situation as uneasy. And so we see this is a top issue for them, but it's also a source of significant anxiety and something that Democrats certainly need to be contending with as we head into 2024. Norm talked about the issue of abortion. This was obviously a huge issue in 2022. We, we expect it'll be a huge issue for Democratic messaging in 2024. Uh, I think the news this week about attacks to IVF, IVF services in, in certain states really underscores how, how damaging the Dobbs decision has been for Americans. Um, but this is an, an opportunity uh, for Democrats to, re, to frame the debate on one of uh, extremism on the Republican side. When we look at uh, Hispanic voters nation nationwide, they are solidly with Democrats on this, is this, this issue. 45% of Hispanic voters say abortion is morally acceptable and should be legal. Another 36% say um, that they might not personally be for abortion, but they don't think government should ban it. And only 15% of Hispanic voters share the Republican position that abortion is morally wrong and should be illegal. So this is an incredible opportunity for us to go on offense and highlight Republican extremism. Now, with Hispanic voters, how should we talk about um, uh, the topic of abortion? And I should note, I have I have data here um, from work we've actually done with Somos Montante. So I wanna underscore the amazing work that they do. Melissa will speak to it more, but uh, we wanted to share some of the research we did with them with you all. We did a framing exercise where we tested democratic messaging uh, on um, abortion with Hispanics. One, which we, la which we labeled dangerous, talks about how Republican policies are dangerous uh, to, to Americans. The other, which we labeled freedom, talks about how Republicans uh, are taking away America's freedoms to ban abortion. Um, when we tested those, the good news is that Hispanic voters agree with the democratic position against the Republican position in either scenario, uh, but we have a larger margin with Hispanic voters when we emphasize attacks on freedoms and that Republicans are trying to what, take away our rights to determine uh, how we should, uh, what, what healthcare decisions to make for our own selves. What does all this mean for the election? Um, the good news, we did, a, we did this survey with Somos and battleground states uh, late last year. Um, and we see that in these battleground states, majorities of Hispanic voters uh, uh, align with Democrats. 52% identify as Democrats, 50% say they would uh, vote for a Democrat for president. When we name Biden and Trump, we have Biden at 52% support, Trump at 38% support, um, so a large lead. Uh, the good news is that we have Biden up by double digits in these battleground states. We have a margin of 14 points of, of support for him over Trump. The warning side in this data is that in 2020, Biden won Hispanic voters in these states by 27 points. So his margin, Biden's margin right now with these voters is half of what it was in 2020. Um, it's not necessarily that these voters like Trump any better. Trump's getting about the same with these voters. It's that 10% of Hispanic voters who tell us they're undecided in the presidential race. We need to consolidate them and turn them out uh, to match our 2020 performance. And so this is a conversation about persuasion and turnout. I'm going to talk about the two key states here, um, looking at Hispanic voters starting in Arizona. Um, so Arizona, we have 50% of Hispanic voters identifying as Democrats. 52% uh, would vote for Biden, 39% um, for Trump. 53% uh, tell us they'd vote for a Democrat for Senate. But when we do the three-way uh, named vote, we see Ruben Gallego is at 47%, Kirsten Sinema is at 21%, and then Republican Lamb is at 21%. Um, so we need Gallego to get over that 50% mark at least. One opportunity for him, you can see when we ask if, if voters have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of Gallego, 
43% of Hispanic voters in, in Arizona are not familiar with him. They can't rate him as either favorable or unfavorable. So he has an opportunity, and those of us working in Arizona have an opportunity to introduce voters to Ruben Gallego. He's running statewide for the first time uh, and make sure they turn out and support him. Um, again, in Arizona, when we look at the presidential, um, we have Biden up by 13 points. In 2020, he won Hispanics in Arizona by 28 points. And remember, Arizona was a state that Biden won by 10,000 votes. So Hispanic voters are going to play an incredible role here, important role here in determining who wins this state. Um, just a note, we did a, a short messaging exercise in the survey, and we actually found in Arizona, which is a large population of, of swing voters in, among the Hispanic universe, uh, it was actually more uh, important for us to go negative on Trump, to articulate the stakes of the election if Trump wins, rather than to do positive messaging on Biden uh, as it relates to boosting Biden's margin. This is the same data um, in Nevada. So we have a slightly more Democratic Hispanic universe in Nevada. 56% identify as Democratic, 28% as Republican. 54% uh, of Hispanics in Nevada would vote for Biden, 37% for Trump. That's a 17 point lead. We need to get Biden closer to where he was in, in 2020, which was a 22 point lead. So we're a little closer to Nevada, but still not where we need to be. Um, on the Senate vote, we have Senator Jackie Rosen at 56% to 28% with Hispanic voters. Um, and again, here, lots of opportunity to improve uh, where the Senator is with Hispanic voters in the state. Uh, she is an incumbent, but 52% of Hispanic voters couldn't rate her on the favorability scale. They were unfamiliar with her. So we need to do more uh, to uh, you know, communicate about the Senator and communicate about the stakes of the election. Uh, in, in this survey on the presidential race in Nevada, we actually found it was more beneficial in Nevada to do positive communication on Biden. Uh, that was uh, better at boosting support for him. So I know that was a lot, um, but I'm happy to uh, pause there and answer uh, any questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Katie. Uh, well, we you talked about um, some of those votantes. Let's go to uh, Melissa right now, and, and uh, Katie, I want you to stick around as well. Uh, if we can go to uh, um, Melissa Morales, founder and president of Somos Votantes, which has been uh, working extensively to uh, turn out the vote uh, in Arizona and um, Nevada. Melissa, welcome. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Katie, for presenting that, um, the data. It always is just a, a stark reminder to me of the amount of work that we have to do, um, which is why I'm so excited to be here with all of you um, to talk about what that work looks like for us this year. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Melissa Morales. I'm the founder and president of Somos Votantes and Somos PAC. And just a very quick introduction for our work for those who aren't familiar. We are a Latino-focused organization that runs large-scale programs in battleground states. So our org is really built on the question, what could our government and our democracy look like if people who looked like me, who looked like my parents, my family, my community participated more? How different would the conversations in rooms like these be? How different would the conversation in uh, policy rooms in DC be if we got more involved? And so to your credit, I think the fact that I've been invited to speak to you um, tells me we are on our way to making that happen together. But just at the top here, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining. I know that you all understand as we do that the stakes couldn't be higher for us in 2024. Um, and I'm very excited to share the work that we're doing in both Arizona and Nevada. Um, just to level set, as we think about the work already underway and ahead of us this year, we know that this year every single inch is going to matter. You know, what happens at the margins, as you heard Katie talk about how close the margins have been in both of these states over the last two cycles. So what happens at those margins is really going to matter this year, right? What happens with voters at the margins is the difference between losing a U.S. Senate seat in 2018 in Florida by 10,000 votes and the domino effect that set off and winning a U.S. Senate seat in Nevada in 2022 by about 8,000 votes. So when we think about the Latino vote in Arizona and Nevada, every shift, every point in the Latino vote really has the potential to be game changing and decisive. So Somos does not take that lightly, lightly, and we really, um, it's incumbent on us, I think, to commit to not only being bigger, but being better and more effective in our Latino voter outreach programs this year. But of course, the question when I say that is always, well, how do we do that? 
Uh, so to answer the question, it, it really is through dedicated time, energy, and investments. And just to give you a look at the type of work that we do, um, I have a, a couple of slides here to just highlight a, a couple of big points. In 2022, Somos built and ran some of the largest independent Latino voter programs in the country with investments totaling over $23 million across battleground states. And our work really included everything from traditional methods like door-to-door -door canvassing and conversations, um, but also some out-of-the-box things. So strategically targeting high traffic areas for voter engagement like bus stops in Vegas headed into shift changes and Saturday morning soccer games in Latino neighborhoods in Phoenix. And we layered all of our program in 2022 with radio, digital, television programs in English and in Spanish to really create what is a surround sound of culturally competent messaging, which is sort of our special sauce. Um, if we take a look at our nonpartisan civic engagement work uh, in 2022, this is the type of work that really helps us to create a more engaged and educated Latino electorate. This is the backbone for our long-term organizing and communications programs in our state. And this work also includes, um, you know, vote by mail, spread out the vote, make a plan to vote programs, really educating our community on the mechanics of voting, answering some of that, those questions that they have about the mysteries of voting. What's gonna happen when I get there? Do I need to take something with me? Where do I go? What times can I go? Um, so really all of that up to the core component of Somos's mission of maximizing Latino voter participation in elections. Beyond that, on the next slide, um, through our political work, we are also able to engage our community explicitly and specifically in support of candidates, which we know this year when we look at the amount of undecideds and the role that they will play at the margins um, of our elections, there is going to be a lot that we need to do, and we need to do that very early to begin to have the hard conversations. I saw some of the um, the chat about how are we having some sensitive conversations. Those are things that we can only do if we're starting early um, in order to move people and to move the undecided. So you can see here some of the work that we were able to do in 2022. And you know these massive investments in 2022, when I talk about time, energy, investment, led to critical wins across the country, including Arizona and Nevada. To give you an example, Latino support nationally held steady for Democrats at 62%, which was really an effort when we had been looking at the downward trend of Latino voter support over the past three election cycles. In Arizona, where we ran one of our largest programs, Latino support for Senator Mark Kelly was at 67% compared to President Biden's 63% in 2020. And if we go to the next slide, just to put a finer point on our impact in Nevada, where we ran our largest program in 2022, over 74,000 Latinos that we outreached voted, including over 8,000 Latinos that we had targeted who had the lowest possible likelihood of voting. So I'm sure you all have heard of vote propensity. There is a scale from zero to 100. Um, zero is the lowest possible likelihood of voting. 100 is the highest possible likelihood of voting. If we look at just voters that that's so most engaged in the zero to 10 category, over 8,000 of them voted. That was larger than the margin of victory in the closest US Senate race in the country in Nevada. And we were able to clinch reelection for Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. So when we talk about the amount of tactics and layering and engagement that is needed um, and what happens on the margins mattering, this is really what we're um, what we're talking about. Um, you know, after one one thing I like to do to just tie a bow on that story and that engagement, if we go to the next slide, um, my fun story for the night, after Senator Cortez Masto's win, she actually came and celebrated with Somos at our victory party. Um, just, you know, I think really continuing to make that connection between our Latino community and democracy and government and the connection that they feel to it. So this is also about what is happening in the long term. What does this look like in the next midterm election cycle or the next presidential election cycle? Um, and is really a way for the community that pulls them into that democratic process. And then just a final note before I talk specifically about what Arizona and Nevada look like for us this year. Um, the work done by independent organizations like Somos, I think, is always a critical layer of work that's needed to fill in the gaps and reach those really hard to reach people that campaigns often can't. But I do think this year, maybe more than most, it's incredibly necessary that, gr that groups like ours are out having uh, conversations with people face to face every day who particularly may not trust the campaign or may not trust the Democratic Party right now. We are a space where they can engage. 
uh, where they can have conversations, where they can feel connected to what is happening politically that isn't necessarily the party or the campaign. Um, and I think that really is a, is a critical piece. These voters we've seen consistently respond better to voices from within their own communities, which is what our programs are designed to do. Um, and I just want to address, I saw a question in the chat about why SOMOS as opposed to other orgs. And I always say that there is so much work to do that it is going to take all of our collective programs at their strongest to get this work done. So SOMOS is really proud to be working in coalition with America Votes, the other America Votes organizations, other strong organizations in state um, to really get this work done together. And yeah. um, uh, uh, Melissa, let me just br bring up that when we ask groups to come on, we we have vetted them uh, uh, very carefully, gone through and make sure that they're you know, do, do, doing the work that they say that they're doing. Um, this is the second time we've had your organization on in the past year, and we're going to have other organizations on uh, in our special events uh, in the in the months to come. So um, there'll be there's a lot of room for everyone, a lot of work to do. Uh, can I ask you one question? Because uh, we, there was a question from Joni from St. Louis who asked about the Hispanic voting block, and it's not a monolith. And we talked about this um, yesterday. Uh, and you know maybe um, uh, Katie and Norm can. Uh, jump in on this as well. But you talked about uh, the immigration policy, mm -hmm. uh, how Hispanics in Arizona are more concerned about border security, while, while in Nevada, they're more concerned about a path to citizenship. If you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, I think it is interesting because generally we talk about, and I even reference when I'm talking about program Latinos in general, but I, I again, this year, maybe more than ever, we've seen some differences, um, even Katie, in, in the research that we were doing together. So SOMOS has spent a lot of time um, and energy over the last year on research and messaging in the context of the presidential reelect in the political environment that we're in right now. Um, and part of what we've seen, there's, there's sort of a couple of key differences that, that stuck out to me in the, um, the survey that we did with GSG um, last fall, which was one big one between Nevada and Arizona, where um, in Nevada, we are seeing a Latino electorate, um, where we see a larger portion that are self-identified Democrats, even if they're not necessarily registered as a Democrat right now, they might be registered as a, a no party affiliation, but they're self-identified Democrats who tend to just um, sit it out, who may have sat it out in one of the last two elections. Whereas in Arizona, we're seeing a Latino electorate that is much more swing. They are they are true swing voters who are sort of right now um, in a, a plague on both your houses type of mindset. And so they responded as opposed to Latino Demo, uh, Latinos in Nevada who responded much uh, much better to Biden positive messaging. Latinos in Arizona were responding much better to uh, being presented with Trump negative messaging. So being reminded why you dislike the other guy and then the contrast, but what are Democrats trying to do that's more aspirational as well? What are, we, what are the rights we are protecting? So um, I do think there's gonna be some need to be some nuance between the two states. Um, that has be, started to be the case we've seen, as you said, uh, with immigration, right? We're keeping an eye on issues like abortion, but more recently issues such as immigration, which really worked their way into the national narrative. And then, of course, you know, you start to hear that bubble up. Um, and I think that is going to play out much differently in Arizona, a border state where this has sort of been a continuous conversation that's happened over the last four years versus Nevada, a non-border state. Um, so those are the sorts of nuances that we'll continue to flesh out and build into our program and messaging. And Katie, I'm sure you've seen something like that pop up in your research already. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I would just say, I think like this is a very dynamic situation we're in, right? Um, think a lot's going to change in the next nine months. And so, you know, I know SOMOS is keeping a really close eye um, on, on, you know, the Hispanic and Latino electorate in the states that they're working with. I totally want to, under, want to underscore the note that these are not monolith groups. And uh, that's always something pollsters are guilty of is putting people into these buckets and then treating them like they're all the same. I think, you know, Melissa talked about culturally competent engagement and, and that's key here um, and making sure that we're understanding that the nuances of the communities we're speaking with on things like, um, you know, language preference, generation, all those things. I know SOMOS looks uh, very closely in the research we do to inform messaging and programmatic decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, let me just sure. uh, add a couple of elements here. First, you know, it really is important to underscore, and this is something I think that the Democratic Party has fallen short of for a very long time, 
there are so many nuances within this community. And it's not just the differences between uh, Venezuelan Americans, Colombian Americans, and Mexican Americans. As Melissa suggested, it's within the Mexican American community as well. We certainly saw that in Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, where you have people who've been there for 150 years, and they don't see people coming across the border as anything like them. Uh, so we we have to figure out how to message this in different ways. And I think there's an opportunity here with the border issue. First of all, we know that uh, what Stephen Miller, Steve Bannon, and others have said is they want to round up all undocumented people, put them into camps, and then deport them. That issue has to be a focal point. But at the same time, Republicans have given us an opportunity here by blowing up the border issue uh, in the House of Representatives. Now, that may change, but I think there's an, uh, an opening for Biden to show that he's trying to find a deal that secures the border, but also stands four square for uh, the right thing to do with undocumented people who are in this country. And it's getting that message balanced and out there and having people like Melissa and Katie who can carry it forward, that will be the key to making sure that we don't fall short in these key states. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask the three of you about uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris going down to Nevada, to Arizona. Uh, when do you expect that's going to happen? How many visits do you anticipate? Uh, how does that all work out? So I know that the president ahead of the um, and the vice president ahead of the Democratic primary in Nevada did visit the state. And I do think just the early engagement that we've seen uh, by the Biden administration is, and his surrogates. Obviously, I work on the IE side. I don't work on the official side. My lawyers would like me to to make that very clear that there is a there is a separation between the two. But I did see how much it, it excites the base, right? Who is sort of trying to figure out where their place is right now. Um, what is the president going to do? They're hearing a lot from Trump, um, especially from the mainstream media, um, who who tend to amplify anything that he does or he says. And so I, I do think that while there are there are questions that remain for portions of the Democratic coalition, um, anytime the president and the vice president visit a state, it excites the base, which is always a good thing to do, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Let me and I want to get to two quick questions, one from uh, Dan Jaffe about um, uh, how do you deal with uh, Biden's age and the claims of his uh, cognitive decline? Uh, and from Bert, um, how is Gaza playing? Uh, we talked about Michigan uh, earlier this evening. Um, is, that a, is that a concern? Is that uh, something that just needs to play out over the months to see what happens? I'll Go take ahead. on the age issue a little bit. Um, I think we saw uh, at least a beginning of a good start with the appearance that uh, the president made on Seth Meyers' show last night. I'd like to see him go on all of those shows. Um, and I would also like to see him do lengthy interviews with the likes of Rachel Maddow and Lawrence O'Donnell and uh, maybe a Wolf Blitzer. I'd like to see him do a 60 Minutes interview. And a part of it, you would hope, is talking about how, because of his stuttering, that there are times when he slips up and he makes mistakes, but also, you know, people uh, sometimes get uh, confused in some of the things that they say. But he has to take the age issue on frontally and go in places where, with lengthy interviews, he shows what everybody who's been in small group settings with him has seen, which is that he has not lost a step mentally at all. I'm a little worried, frankly, also on the physical side, not that he isn't in great shape, but partly for long-standing physical uh, conditions, he tilts a little bit, he's stilted when he walks. And people see that and they think it's a measure of age. And they have to find a better way of dealing with that, including showing that this is a, a somebody who is really fit and is doing well, but he can't ignore this issue and he has to take it on in that fashion. The other thing that I'll say is that we're hearing on the ground is, especially for Latino voters, they're very solutions oriented. So when when they say they are looking for a strong leader, I think there's the traditional what is physically strong, which is where people take the age thing. But they're also for them is is what are the policies he's putting forward? So I think with this this border security 
um, issue and the way that he's dealing with that, with other issues that come up, he can, by being very solutions oriented and forward in that way, um, can prove himself to be a strong leader to people, which I think is what they're looking for right now. So I, I think they've done, the Biden administration has taken a lot of good steps in that direction. Um, but I, I think I'm hoping that is is what we'll continue to see from them as well, because that is one way that we are able to combat um, when people talk about his age is to really pivot to his strong policies. Okay. And some of them in the chat just uh, mentioned that uh, Biden should see a chiropractor. I'm sure that um, he's getting all the uh, health treatment um, he requires. I want to thank all three of you very much uh, uh, for this uh, conversation, a great kickoff to our look at the target states. And again, we're going to be looking at the five additional states um, uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, and remember, uh, go to uh, Partners for Democracy. Uh, .org or .com, both work. I'll look in the chat. And um, and if you couldn't, can support uh, Somos Montantes, uh, that would be great. Uh, and with that, I will throw it back to Ed Cohen. Ed, you're muted. Okay. There you are. Regular mistake. Um, Th thanks very much, uh, Jim, for passing this back. And Norm and uh, uh, Melissa and Katie, thank you, Katie. I know you <laughs> filled in at the last minute. You did a terrific job, so thank you. Um, as I indicated, and as Jim has repeated, we're going to be focusing on these uh, uh, special events over the next two months on the target states. This will be... Uh, recorded or this has been recorded it'll be posted on our website we'll send you a link so if you have friends uh who would like to see it or you think might benefit from it please send it to them if each of you would just send it to two people two people in your network uh and they do the same uh, our movement will grow um and again i want to talk a little bit about contributions one of the things i've learned with partners for democracy after doing this for several years and it's very difficult to get people to contribute to organizations like uh, Somos Votantes because unlike an election you either win you lose you see whether your candidate's very visible you can watch how they're spending your money um, not so much with these groups but I will tell you something this election's going to be won or lost by how good a job Somos Votantes and other groups like them do in getting out our vote uh, and if if they're not able to to get our uh, can it, our our voters out to the polls, we're not going to win. So it's not sexy, uh, but it's effective. And I think if you didn't have a lot of confidence in Melissa uh, and her organization after tonight, I'm not sure what would persuade you. So please go to our website, partnersfordemocracy.org, click on the donate button, uh, and think about what's at stake. Stake. So, Jim, thank you for leading us through tonight's speakers. Uh, you will shortly be getting an invitation from us for our March program. And with that, I thank you for joining us, and I wish you a good night. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you next month.